a dangerous economic move in, in some respects because we didn't know that the Americas were going to win the war. Uh, for all we knew, we might not win the war at all. Experimental plants were opened in 1942 and worked. Allied brass, who understood the importance of morale, were happy to get behind the project, none more so than a Coke drinker named Eisenhower. In June 1943, this telegram came from Ike's headquarters in North Africa to Coke headquarters in Atlanta. In it, a tall order. Six million bottles of Coke a month and fast. Filling this order was the responsibility of longtime company engineers who served as technical observers in Army uniform but without official Army rank. The technical observers, or TOs, who went out into the field, they faced danger. Some were killed. After the Normandy invasion, they went riding across the plains in, in France uh, with these uh, smaller field bottling units in the back of the jeeps. Uh, they, they helped the GI uh, liberate Europe. They, they were there as part of the scene. And these guys were working in the conditions where, you know, you didn't have electricity easily, you didn't have a lot of raw materials to work with, and you had to basically make it up as you went along. And suddenly, you have the old familiar Coke bottle showing up in foxholes with American GIs, and their emotional response to this familiar icon from home is genuine, it's heartfelt, it's lasting. And because of that, we have literally hundreds of letters from GIs recounting their emotional experience at being able to have just a little bit of American life near the battle. I can truthfully say that I haven't seen smiles spread over a bunch of boys' faces as they did when they saw Coca-Cola in this godforsaken place. It is surprising what a little thing like a Coca-Cola means to a man in the fighting over here. Coke became a fixture at stage door canteens around the world. And here, First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt enjoys the pause that refreshes. The soda's new worldwide presence inspired a new slogan, the Global High Sign, a tagline that accompanied ads featuring soldiers and sailors relaxing with Coca-Cola. And I think that they really helped sell the war effort. If you look at some of those ads, it's men in uniform talking about the war. They didn't hide it. They didn't try to avoid it at all. And oh, by the way, you should have a Coca-Cola, just like the soldiers that are away from home. By war's end, there were 64 bottling plants in operation, from Egypt to Iceland, from Iran to New Guinea. Five billion bottles of Coca-Cola were sold to GIs around the world. The cost of bottling near the front lines had been high. Keeping the price for soldiers at five cents a bottle was often a losing proposition. But the investment would prove to be worth it. 95% of all soft drinks sold to U.S. troops abroad were Coca-Cola during the war. A survey by the American Legion just after the war showed that more than 60% of veterans said Coke was their favorite soft drink. The closest runner-up got about 7%. Since this had created such a powerful link between the values they were fighting for and this product, it seems inevitable that after World War II, they would choose that product above all others for most occasions and begin to introduce it into the new family life that's coming into focus as a part of the suburbanizing of America. These are your neighbors, people like you, with time for leisure, time for modern living. These people are in tune with the times. 
in the 1950s, after two decades of depression and world war, America was ready to sit back, relax, and have a Coke. It was something of a golden age for Coca-Cola, the perfect accompaniment to an era of good, clean fun. These fellows are pretty satisfied. Yard chores done, they're taking time out for refreshment. The years of shortages, penny-pinching, and rationing were over, forgotten in a burst of confidence and prosperity. By then, Coke was secure in its place as America's favorite soft drink, something people could agree on in all walks of life. As for the competition, well, nobody at the Atlanta headquarters of the Coca-Cola company was too concerned about that. In my days with the company, the opposition was called, quote, the imitator, end quote. Now, I did hear someone occasionally refer to a product called P-Cola, but I never worried much about the opposition, and I felt like we could always overcome it. But even a cultural icon can have growing pains. For more than three decades, you either bought a Coke at a soda fountain or in the classic green bottle. Six and a half ounces, no more, no less. Robert Woodruff, still the driving force behind Coke, thought things were perfect just as they were. It was consumers who changed the way Coke was delivered in typical 50s fashion. Before the war, the grocery store delivery boy would lug home a case of bottles and put it in the icebox for you. Now housewives were doing their own shopping, and few relished the chore of handling cases of Cokes. Well, as one of Woodruff's critics within the company said, you're, you're demanding that a housewife carry home a wooden crate with 24 thick glass bottles with six and a half ounces of Coke each in it, it's hard for a truck driver to lift that, let alone a housewife. We're not giving the American consumer what she wants. Oh yeah, I, I've worked uh, routes and uh, I've ridden routes and you would have to be a pretty, pretty sturdy man. I know I was up in Baltimore and we had the Baltimore uh, Colts uh, tackle, Art Donovan, who worked out uh, delivering Coca-Cola in the summers to stay in shape. The answer came in 1955. There's a giant living in our house. It's Coca-Cola in the new family size bottle. Biggest bottle of Coke you ever saw. Bigger bottles, all carefully designed to resemble the old familiar classic bottle. In three bottle sizes. As one executive put it, bringing out another bottle was like being unfaithful to your wife. Coca-Cola in the standard size and... But consumers had spoken. And just look at how that big family size bottle makes Coke so easy to serve. Use that big... The thing you want most in the 50s is easy. So you want the supplies of Coke right in your house. That's a real change for Coca-Cola, too, which has been so much associated with the workplace. And then even with uh, the armed forces, suddenly now, uh, it becomes something that is indispensable for the home. And the message of these changes was coming to Americans through a wooden box that stood in the corner of more and more living rooms every day. Come on in. Fisher's the name. You know, I enjoy watching TV just like you do. And I know this. TV's even more fun with a bottle of Coke at hand. There's nothing like the flavor of ice-cold Coca-Cola. In the 50s, Americans watching television were largely watching themselves. And the parade of goods brought to them courtesy of post-war prosperity. Electric Kalamazoo. To end, you'll see how like it. Lots of gasoline that... Coca-Cola had been on the air, the radio, since 1927. Yes, friends, it's time for another transcribed session of the Coke Club. And here's Morton Downey.
But television was really the medium, I think, that brought it to the forefront because it was in everybody's homes. But more importantly, you could see the product, you could hear the product, because remember they always were showing the carbonation and how everything was fizzing out of the glass, and also see people being refreshed by the product. Television commercials were rare in those days. Instead, companies would sponsor entire shows and weave their advertising into the flow of the program. The Adventures of Ozzy and Harriet was sponsored by Coca-Cola for several years. Look, from now on, I'll serve Coca-Cola and you serve the steak. Not on your life. Parties are more fun when you do the cooking. Here, have a Coke and cheer up. That's the best idea yet. <laughs> or you would have Kit Carson or one of his sidekicks showing kids how to rope a steer or mount a horse. Oh, and after you'd gone through this bit of activity, naturally you'd be thirsty.